Good evening, my name is Bill Maris with Circuit Rider Ministries. And on behalf of my associate, Dan Diamore, we would like to welcome you to this, the final session in our series, What in the World is Happening? A Study of End Times Prophecy. We begin all of our studies with the words of Martin Luther, Sola Scriptura, by Scripture alone. We believe that whenever someone shares with you from the Scriptures, you have to hold them to a very strict biblical standard, that the words that they share with you can be backed up biblically. We, tonight we'll be sharing things that um, are somewhat provocative, but we trust that we'll be able to make a very fair biblical case based on a fair reading of the text. You'll have to be the judge. But once again, hold us to a very strict biblical standard. If we can't make a biblical case for what we're going to share with you, it's of no value whatsoever. But we trust we'll be able to do that. We also believe that it's very important, as much as we can today in the 21st century, to try to look at Scripture through Jewish eyes, particularly first century Jewish eyes. Every one of the writers of the New Testament was a first century Jew, with the possible exception of Dr. Luke, who was Greek, but certainly understood Jewishness. He was uh, uh, the partner of Paul on his journeys and uh, was an initiate, a proselyte in the, in the Jewish faith. So clearly, it is important, that if we can, to look through Jewish eyes. Uh, I believe that uh, God is the author of Scripture, but he gave to the various writers his word through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But then I also believe that they gave it to us through their Jewish frame of reference. Unfortunately, I think the uh, predominantly Gentile church in the 21st century has lost some of the subtleties, the nuances, even the beauty of uh, Scripture because we've lost our Jewish roots. Uh, so once again, looking through Jewish eyes. Tonight that will be very important, as you can see as we uh, progress. Well, this is the study of end times, eschatology. It's a great biblical mystery, but it is not a salvation issue. We can disagree on this. It's just a mystery. It's, it's, it's something that I believe will help you with your faith, your testimony, but again, not a salvation issue. But here's the good news. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. This is from Revelation 1.3. So you'll get a blessing for being with us tonight. Well, what we'd like to propose to you is what we're calling an End Times Bible Roadmap. It's 10 stops on the highway, on the prophetic highway, and we're going to go through each of the 10 stops tonight. Uh, we did go through each of them in detail in the previous five sessions, but tonight we're going to summarize them and then conclude with what I believe will be nothing less than a brick through a plate glass window in terms of its impact, you be the judge. So here's road signs number one and number two. Daniel chapter nine, verses 20 to 27, and Matthew 24, verses one through 44. This is Sir Isaac Newton, the uh, uh, great eminent scholar and scientist. He was actually uh, voted some years ago by the American Academy of Sciences as the greatest genius of all time. You would have thought in their polling that uh, Albert Einstein would have won. He came in second. And they said that Sir Isaac Newton was the greatest genius ever. But uh, despite all of his uh, scientific achievements, he was an eminent Bible scholar. I can't pass on his theology because my understanding is that Isaac Newton was a Unitarian, uh, so I would have difficulty with that, of course, uh, believing in the triune God. But um, he spent much of his time studying the book of Daniel. It was something that he took great interest in. And uh, he called... Daniel chapter 9, the greatest prophecy in Scripture. He said that if you threw out all of the Old Testament prophecies, some 340 about the coming of the Messiah, that Jesus fulfilled every one, that all you need is Daniel chapter 9, uh, verse 20 through 27, to prove Jesus was who he said he was. Well, let's take a quick look at this. But before we do, I have to warn you, the rabbis have actually in the Talmud put a curse, a Jewish curse on anyone who studies Daniel chapter 9, looking for the Messiah, particularly looking to prove Jesus as the Messiah. Here's the rabbinic curse. Blasted are the bones of those who calculate the date of the advent of the Messiah. It's from the Babylonian Talmud. So it's something we need not worry about because we have the full armor of God. But once again, the 70 weeks prophecy, Daniel chapter 9. Now I'm going to read it out of, uh, out of Scripture, out of the NIV, and then we're going to parse it uh, through the Hebrew and see what it might actually be. But before we do, let me give you a little bit of context here. The prophet Daniel was in Babylon in captivity, and he was doing his nightly prayers, 
when all of a sudden, no less a person than the Archangel Gabriel appeared to him, the same one who 600 years later would appear to Zechariah in the temple proclaiming the birth of John the Baptist, and then the following six months, the very important message to the Virgin Mary about the birth of our Lord. Certainly a very important messenger. Angel Angelos in the Greek means messenger. This is certainly a supreme messenger. And uh, must have been a very important message. Will you be the judge? And this is what that message was for Daniel. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. No one understands this from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes. There will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end of sacrifice and offerings. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Well, what in the world was that? <laughs> what in the world is all that? And he says, no one understands this. Well... Let's look at it through Jewish eyes and try to parse it and, and uh, try to see what it actually means. Once again, let's first go to our second stop in the road map and show you how important a message this is. The Lord Jesus himself actually quoted from this prophecy in his Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, let the reader understand, then let those that are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now Jesus here is giving the greatest end times lecture, the great, greatest end times session ever given in history, the Olivet Discourse. He's talking about the last days here, and he's quoting Daniel chapter 9, again, germane to the last days. So let's go back and look at this again and parse it through Jewish eyes. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people. Now, the actual word in the Hebrew for seven is Shavuah. And Shavuah is seven as you would count in time. It's counting time in a set of seven. It would be seven days, seven weeks, seven years, seven centuries. It could be any time frame counted in sevens. So a week, a week of days, a week of weeks, a week of years, if you would. Now, seventy sevens... 77s, or 490, are decreed for your people. Now, who were Daniel's people? Obviously, they were the Jews, the Hebrews, and your holy city, Jerusalem. And here's what happens during these 70 weeks. And if you have a King James Version, that's the way it would actually be written. 70 weeks are decreed for your people. That's how Shavuot has been uh, translated in the English. Now, this is what happens. This, if you would, is the Jewish watch. For 70 weeks, what's going to take place during the time of the Jews? It will put an end to all transgression, put an end to sin, to atone for all the wickedness in the world, to bring in everlasting righteousness, the kingdom of God, to seal up all the visions and prophecies, to fulfill all the prophecies, and most importantly, to anoint the most holy. Now, we know who this is because the anointed one in Hebrew is Mashiach, Messiah, or in Greek, Christos or Christ. In other words, to anoint, to bring in, to coronate the Messiah, the Christ. Very important. Very important. And then he goes on to tell Daniel, no one understands this, from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the Messiah, comes, there will be 69 weeks. What's going to happen, though, is after the 69 weeks takes place, the Messiah is going to be killed. So in other words, once the Jews are allowed, once the decree allows them to leave Babylonian captivity and go back and rebuild Jerusalem, start counting, and 69 weeks later, the Messiah will come, and it must have really stunned Daniel, the Messiah will come and will be killed. They'll have nothing. But remember, that's 69 out of 70 weeks, and Gabriel doesn't stop there. 
Well, before he does, let's take a look at when this decree may have actually been issued. Scholars really would point to a, a very clear date as to when this actually would have began. And we get it from the book of Nehemiah. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, I, Nehemiah, said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruin and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, Well, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my request. Now we can ascertain exactly when this took place, because it's in the 20th year of the reign of King Artaxerxes. We know Artaxerxes was a real Persian king. He was the son of Xerxes, who was the same one who was married to Esther uh, in the book of Esther. And uh, he is also the one that uh, invaded Greece, the story of the 300 Spartans. That would be King Xerxes. He was assassinated. Xerxes was assassin assassinated in 465 BC, and his son Artaxerxes then took the throne. This is the 20th year of his reign, hence this is the year 44, by 445 BC. We also know that it's in the month of Nisan, which would be the um, calendar month on the Babylonian, Persian, and Hebrew calendar, uh, equal to our late March and early April. So we know exactly when this took place, the year 445 B.C. That's when we start counting the 69 weeks. Now, did Jesus come 69 weeks later in, um, dare I say, 443 B.C.? Well, certainly not. But that's if we're using weeks as seven day weeks. But what about if we use weeks of years? 69 times 7 is 483 Jewish years. A Jewish year is, 100, uh, is 360 days in length, a lunar calendar. We actually come, believe it or not, to the year 30 AD, the actual year that the Messiah Jesus was cut off. The prophecy is absolutely perfect. Daniel has to be taken very seriously. Incredible precision. Now I share this with you now because the rest of the evening we're going to take a look at this precision going forward. But wait. There was more to this prophecy. Daniel then went on and explained that there would be another ruler who would come. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, will destroy Jerusalem all over again. The end, this is the last days, the end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. There's one seven left. Remember, there were 69 weeks of years transpired at the death of Jesus, but there's one seven left, one seven-year period, one Shavuot left. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offerings, and on a wing of the temple, again, he will cause a desolation abomination and causes desolation. This is the Antichrist. This is who Jesus is talking about and getting the Jews to beware in his Olivet Discourse. The words of Daniel 9 also pointed to an evil ruler during the last days. The Lord Jesus actually quotes this passage from Daniel, this Olivet Discourse, and it's referring, it's again, to the last days, the Antichrist. Road sign number three. This is from Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 32. But we're going to point out and ask at the beginning, are the Jews still the chosen people? Yes or no? Now, the church today has a doctrine uh, which has developed over the last 2,000 years, which for the sake of a better term, uh, we'll call replacement theology. It really crystallized in the 4th century in the writing of St. Augustine, although it was, it was actually earlier uh, in the church that it had uh, come into play. And Augustine wrote that the Jews had lost their birthright in his book, The City of God. That when they crucified their Messiah, they basically lost their birthright um, in the same way that Esau did with Jacob. Augustine then postulated the church is now spiritual Israel. And all the promises, all the covenants God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob now vest in the church. I might add it is the majority position of the church today. 
Uh, most mainline do denominations would, would ascribe to this, would uh, uh, advocate replacement theology. Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, most of the mainline Protestant denominations, uh, Lutheran, uh, Anglican, Episcopalian, Presbyterian. Uh, again, you have to say, well, what's left? Well, the minority opinion is the evangelicals, uh, but once again, that's the one that we uh, as circuit writers hold to and we'll be discussing tonight, but we'll share with you why. And it really comes down to this passage more than anything else. This is from Rabbi Saul. You know him better as the Apostle Paul. From Romans 11, and he's writing, note this, to the Roman Gentile Christians. I, Paul, ask them, did God reject his people? By no means, and it's exclamatory, exclamation point. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Again, I asked, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Again, exclamatory. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. He then goes on to say, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers. Whenever you see Paul use the word mystery, <coughs> excuse me, mysterion, the antenna should come out of your head. Because here he's offering something which is new that uh, to the church is a, is a new teaching. He does this uh, with Ephesians 5 when he talks about the mystery of the bride of Christ uh, being the church. Uh, he talks about um, uh, the mystery of the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4.15 and in 1 Corinthians 15.51. The word mysterion. Well, here he's giving us the mystery of the future of the Jews. And he says to the Gentiles, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. I would offer so that you don't think you replace them. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in and so all Israel will be saved. In other words, whenever the full number of the Gentiles comes in, I would offer that's the rapture of the church. Uh, we used to sing, uh, uh, when the saints go marching in, I want to be in that number. Apparently there is a celestial number. And when that full number comes in, Jews and Gentiles, the Christian church, the rapture, at that point, Israel will then come to understanding that it was Jesus as their Messiah all along. We're going to talk about that in detail the rest of the evening. But suffice to say, the Jews are still the chosen people. Roadside number four, this is from Revelation 6, 8, 9, and 16. We studied this in depth in one of our other earlier sections, which you can refer to uh, on our website. But let's go back and look at what happened. The Revelation, the Apocalypse. The Apostle John on the island of Patmos uh, off the uh, uh, coast of Turkey. Uh, this was in 95, circa 95 AD. Uh, if John really saw the end of the world, which I personally believe, Dan and I believe that uh, John really does explain what is literally going to take place in the last days in the book of Revelation. Well, if he does really see the end of the world, one thing we know for certain, it hasn't happened yet. So, for nearly 2,000 years and still counting, the question has to be, how would the apostle describe events and images taking place at least two millennia into the future through the eyes of a Galilean fisherman of the first century? This, of course, we call the Apocalypse. If you have a Roman Catholic Bible, the last book of your Bible is the Apocalypse. If you have a Protestant Bible, it's Revelation. They're identical. The words are identical. It's just that uh, the Catholic Bible uses the Greek Apocalypsis, and uh, the Protestant use, uses Revelatio from the Latin, both meaning the revealing of that which was previously hidden. Now, I studied this as I, uh, I would say for well over 40 years, uh, when I first started uh, studying end times prophecy. And one of the things that has perplexed me for that entire time is the way things line up in Revelation. When you read Revelation, it, it, one of my friends said it seems almost schizophrenic. It bounces around. Things, things just don't, don't seem to, to run in a coherent pattern. I think part of the problem is because of the way it has been uh, discussed, the way it's been taught literally for, for centuries. What I have uh, in front of you right now is a typical tribulation map. I've collected 40, 50 different maps, uh, and what I do with our classes, and what we did with an earlier section in this series, is actually laid them all out. And every one of them, regardless of how they appear, has the same similarity in this 
very important sense. They lay out seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls of wrath as 21 consecutive perils or terrible calamities that befall the earth, judgments, if you would. The seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls. And they're always laid out chronologically. Every commentator that I've read for 40 years discusses them this way without really going any further. Uh, if you find something different, email me because I haven't seen it anywhere. But this is what we think has been part of the problem. And again, if you look at all of them, it's the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. I won't go through all 40 of them. We did that in an early one. But trust me, it's the way they all lay out. Well, I believe the key to reading Revelation, Sola Scriptura, is what we're going to share with you next. And again, you have to look through Jewish eyes. The seven seals. The first seal, I, John, watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. And its rider held a bow and was given a crown, in the Greek, Stephanos. And he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. The question is, well, who's this rider on a white horse? Well, the clues here are given. He is wearing a crown, but the type of crown that he's wearing is a Stephanos in the Greek. The Greek has more than one word for crown that we translate into the English. Stephanos is what we would call a victor's crown. You might recall the Olympics in Athens some uh, decades ago in which every one of the medalists received an, a laurel wreath that they placed on their heads in the same manner as the original Olympians uh, back uh, in ancient Greece. This was a Stephanos, a victor's crown. Uh, whoever this person is, this crowned person is, he is not wearing a diademos. A diademos is the royal crown. That's what Jesus is wearing at the end of Revelation when he returns. This is a warrior. He's carrying a bow. He's a conqueror bent on conquest. Now, he's riding a white horse. He appears to be a man of peace, but he's a conqueror bent on conquest. And remember, Jesus is the one opening the seven seals. So this is not Jesus. This is the Antichrist. We know that also because the remaining three riders are evil. When the Lamb opened the second seal, another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. Of course, this is the color red, the color of blood, the color of war. Mars, Ares, the god of war to the ancients. This is war. The third seal, then the lamb opened the third seal. I looked and there before me was a black horse. The rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice from among the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a day's wages and three quarts of barley for a day's wages and do not damage the oil and the wine. This is famine. This rider is famine. And it's interesting, it's a play on words. Uh, at the time that John saw the Revelation, the Apocalypse, the Emperor Domitian actually had put out an order, the Roman Emperor, that all of the fields in Italy would no longer produce grain, but would only produce wine and oil. In other words, grapes and olives. The people really almost revolted because you can't, you can't eat wine. They still needed bread. And I think what John is doing here is quite, kind of tweaking them uh, that you would literally have to spend a whole day's wage just to eat, but uh, whatever you do, don't upset the wine and the oil. And then the fourth seal. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Death, the fourth horseman. The four horsemen of the apocalypse, the Antichrist, war, famine, and death. Then the fifth seal was opened. When Christ opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? These are the martyrs that die during the tribulation period. This is actually a picture uh, taken from an uh, uh, ancient uh, seminary in um, Bulgaria. And it's a picture of the martyrs crying out to the Lord to avenge their blood. 
I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth. And then the seventh seal. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now this is what I thought about when I first started studying this. This is where it didn't seem to make sense to me. Silence? Silence? Is that a bad thing? For those of you like me who are grandfathers, uh, you love your grandchildren, but... Uh, when you think go home, silence isn't really a bad thing. <laughs> so invariably, this struck me as not an evil thing. Silence, there's nothing wrong with silence uh, as it would uh, normally pertain. So here's where it comes together. The seven seals are not individual things. What they are is they are a combination of continuous evil conditions that last during the entire trouble length of the tribulation period. They're not single events. They're conditions. The Antichrist reigns the whole seven years. That Shevelah, that one seven-year period left. There's wars during the entire seven-year period. There's famine. There's death. There's martyrdom. All of these things take place during the entire... So the seven seals really is the entire seven years. But the seven seal, silence, morphs into the seven trumpet judgments. Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. Question. How would a Galilean fisherman in the first century describe a future nuclear war? We're living 2,000 years later. If there's an all-out war at the end of time, it, but certainly in, in, in this generation or in the near future, it would likely be a nuclear war. Well, how would a Galilean fisherman describe that from the frame of reference uh, that, that uh, he would have had seen these events that take place at least 2,000 years later and counting. How would he describe a nuclear war? Well, perhaps in the following manner. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood that was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Could he be talking about a missile exchange, an aerial attack, fire coming from the sky, nuclear bombardment, modern warfare? Possibly. Well, let's look at the second trumpet. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Now, using our analogy of a nuclear war, what would it look like at sea? Now, this is uh, a picture, a photo, of uh, the first, uh, uh, one of the first hydrogen bomb tests at Bikini Atoll in the South Pacific. And if you notice real close, you can see a number of World War II ships that uh, were scrap ships after the war that were moored at uh, ground zero. If you can see what the effect would be of an atom bomb on a, uh, on a fleet. And they were tossed around like toys. This is later a, a hydrogen bomb test, and you can see it's like a mountain of fire coming out of the water. Could that be what a Galilean fisherman 2,000 years ago, how he would describe a nuclear exchange on the ocean. Well, the third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star, blazing like a torch, fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. Could he be talking again about a missile, a star? Now, Interestingly enough, you be the judge, I, I um, remember back when they had the, the first uh, Gulf War, uh, I remember reading uh, in a dispatch that uh, there was an Arab ham, ham radio operator in um, uh, Saudi Arabia who was uh, describing incoming missiles. You might remember Saddam Hussein was sending uh, Scud missiles into Israel and also into Saudi Arabia where the... Uh, uh, coalition uh, forces were being supplied and where their headquarters were. And these were being taken out by Patriot missiles. This is a Patriot missile, uh, anti-missile missile that was taking out uh, these incoming scuds. Uh, the the uh, Israelis did this recently with great effect, uh, you know, the Iron Dome that they have uh, protecting uh, Israel. 
And again, these anti-missile missiles. Well, interestingly enough, you be the judge, and this really struck me, the ham radio operator described it, described it as a great star blazing like a torch. And I thought, wow, he read Revelation. Well, no, he didn't. He was a Muslim. He didn't read Revelation. He was describing it the way it looked. And I would argue perhaps that's the way the Apostle John would have described an incoming missile. Well, the fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light, and a third of the night. Now, what do scientists tell us will happen after an all-out nuclear war? They tell us that the result would very likely be nuclear winter. The darkening, total darkening of the atmosphere. Wow. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star again, a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. And out of the smoke, locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails and stings like scorpions. Now, many commentators have looked at this. This might have been like uh, as a result of this of this uh, radioactivity, uh, nature itself going crazy, kind of like uh, uh, old Japanese uh, 1950s horror movies with <laughs> giant spiders that uh, that eat New York, that kind of thing. But I think it's a little bit different here. I think what we're talking about, because these have breastplates of iron. There's some kind of weapons. And again, they look like scorpions, and they have their stings in their tails. Could John, 2,000 years ago, be describing modern mechanized warfare with their stings in their tails? You be the judge. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the horns of the golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the river, great river Euphrates. They were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was 200 million. In the early 80s, I was uh, uh, in a, still in the Navy, and I was uh, uh, in a um, naval briefing, an intelligence briefing, and uh, this was the beginning of the year. Uh, and uh, one country had actually that year uh, announced that their standing and reserve army now could total as much as 200 million men and women. 200 million. It was the first time in the history of the world that one nation had an army of 200 million. You have to understand, when John wrote the apocalypse, when he saw this, there weren't 200 million men in the entire world let alone in one army in a nation in the east, in Asia. Well, today, that nation, as you probably already guessed, is China. They can mount an army of upwards of 200 million, the first time in the history of the world that this is possible. Again, Revelation chapter 6, being fulfilled in our lifetime. And then the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Great! The end! But wait, it's not the end. Is anything wrong with this picture? Remember we said there were seven seals, seven trumpets? Why they? Seven bowls. It's not done yet. There's still seven more calamities, judgments, plagues that are rained out in this 21 consecutive way of looking at it. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The seven bowls of wrath. Now here's where it all comes together. Now I've never read this anywhere. I've studied this for more than 40 years. I've looked at every commentary that I could find. It doesn't even pass the Wikipedia test. I can't find this anywhere. You be the judge if this makes sense to you. But this allows me to study Revelation, and it reads like a novel. It reads straight through. And here's what I believe is the key. The seven trumpets are the seven bowls of wrath. One is cause, and the other is effect. Remember, the seven seals are the entire seven-year tribulation period. The seven trumpets and the seven bowls emanate from the seventh seal, and that is cause and effect. Well, let's look at it again. 
This is the actual map, and uh, uh, we're going to go over this at the end of the, of the uh, session. But this is the way we would lay out a tribulation map. Looks pretty busy right now. But suffice to say, at the top are the seven seals, and out of the seven seal morphs, the seven trumpets and the seven bowls. But once again, remember the first trumpet? It was fire and hail mixed with blood was hurled upon the earth. And we said this could be like a nuclear war, like, like a, an aerial bombardment. Well, look at the seven, uh, the, uh, the first bowl. And think about this, the first bowl. The first angel went out and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. Now remember, in all of these seven trumpets, in all those judgments, a third of mankind, a third of this, a third of that are, are killed. But two-thirds are still left. Well, what happens to those two-thirds? Well, this is the rest of the story. We know that after a nuclear exchange, those that survive may be worse off than those that were killed. Remember Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the, the only time that atomic bombs have been used on a, on a population. And remember what happened to many of the survivors. Nuclear radiation had caused severe burns. Perhaps this is what we're talking about, the painful source that broke out on the people. Nuclear radiation, the attack, the trumpets, the result, cause and effect. The first trumpet, the first bowl. Well, remember the second bowl. We talked about a possible nuclear war at sea. A mountain of a blaze thrown into the sea. Possible nuclear exchange at sea. Look at the second bowl. Is this a coincidence? The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea. And it turned into blood like that of a dead man. And every living thing in the sea died. Now this is what happens to the rest of it after the war. You be the judge. Now this is something I think is amazing. You be the judge. Is a giant, this is from uh, Yahoo News, September of 2015. Is a giant mutant wolf fish the result of the Fukushima nuclear disaster? You might remember that that took place. A Japanese fisherman was, has reeled in a huge wolf fish and it has raised concerns about the effects of the Fukushima nuclear disaster in 2011. It is one of the largest wolf fish ever discovered, is around twice the usual size, and its gaping mouth is large enough to fit a small child inside. There are now concerns that the mutant wolf fish is a result of radiation from the Fukushima nuclear disaster. And this is what it looked like. Could it be that what John's talking about, this is just from one nuclear radiation disaster, what's going to happen to nature in the sea after an all-out nuclear war? The third angel sounded his trumpet, remember? And it was a like a star falling from the sky with a tail like a torch. And I said, this could be an incoming rocket. And remember, the name of the star is Wormwood. I want to have that hang there for a minute. An unusual name. The name of the star is Wormwood. Well, once again, look at the third bowl. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became like blood. Remember the third trump trumpet? The star falls on the waters and contaminates them. Could be nuclear radiation. They can't be, they can't be drank from. And again, the third bowl, cause and effect, they become like blood. Well, here's what really is amazing. Nuclear radiation, wormwood, wormwood in Ukrainian and Russian is the word Chernobyl. <laughs> The greatest nuclear radiation accident in the history of the world. When I was in Russia, I remember showing this to our uh, Christian, to our Christian uh, uh, Russian tra uh, English translators, and it stunned them. And I said, "Don't worry, we'll be raptured before this takes place." Why Russian? Well, you'll find out later when we talk about the Battle of Gog and Magog, where that's the, the uh, language that would be most fitting for the word wormwood to be translated. But once again, how can this be a coincidence 2,000 years later? I showed this to a uh, Jewish rabbi friend of mine who is not a Christian, Orthodox Jew. And I said, Rabbi, how can you account for that? He says, I cannot account for it. Wormwood, Chernobyl. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon. Remember, this is nuclear winter. Well, then look what happens. The fourth angel poured out his bull on the sun. And the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues. Once again, the sun caused an effect. What happens? The nuclear war destroys the ozone layer, and now there's nothing to prevent people from being burned up by the radiation. 
from the sun's rays. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and again I saw a star. Remember, this could be possible uh, warfare, continuous warfare that doesn't cease, uh, possible weapons of war, uh, nuke, uh, you know, the um, uh, modern mechanized warfare. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. And men gnawed their tongues in agony, and cursed the God in heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. The wars continue. But evil man still refuses to repent. Now, if you're finding this a little bit hard to accept, this next one, I hope, will have to give you pause. Remember the sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and it was for a 200 million man army to cross the Euphrates from the east, from Asia, to invade, to attack Israel. And, of course, we said that this is the first time in history any nation on earth has a 200 million man army, China. And at the time that this was written, 2,000 years ago, there were 200 million men in the entire world. 200 million people in the entire world, let alone in one army in the east. Well, look at the sixth bowl. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the Oive, great river Euphrates. And its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Well, I thought we did that already. This is cause and effect. You see how these line up? They're not consecutive 21 things. This is seven things, and then they emanate cause and effect. And then finally, you have to look at what happens next before the seventh bowl is, is poured. This is what happens next in Revelation 16. Then I saw three evil spirits. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, Satan, out of the mouth of the beast, the Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs. And they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Then they gather the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon takes place. And we know what happens there. The Lord Jesus wins that battle, destroys the enemies of God. And the seventh trumpet, remember we said the seventh trumpet was rejoicing. The kingdom of the world is now the kingdom of our Lord. Great peals of thunder. We'll look at the seventh bowl. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done, it is finished. The last words of our Lord Jesus from the cross. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. Once again, cause and effect. The victory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Road sign number five, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> the mystery of the rapture. Now, before we proceed, we have to look at what I call the seven sacred convocations. This is taken from the book of Leviticus, chapter 23. Uh, they're often called the seven feasts of Israel, and I think that's a misnomer because actually they're not all feasts. One of them, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, is a fast day. So the actual word in the Hebrew uh, translated into the English as convocations, the seven sacred convocations. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feast, the convocations of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Now the Hebrew word for convocation is mikra, but it has a second meaning. It also means rehearsal. These were rehearsals given to the children of Israel for the coming of the Messiah, all seven of the holy convocations. They are broken out this way. There are four spring convocations, Passover, Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, and Pentecost, the Spring Harvest. Is it a coincidence that the Lord Jesus, the Passover Lamb of God, was sacrificed on the day of preparation beginning the Passover? He was the Passover Lamb, as Paul describes him. He was in the ground the bread of life as our sin offering in the tomb during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the seven days, if you would, that make up Passover. He was in the ground for those three days during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the Sunday, always following the Passover, the Sunday during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Sunday following is always the Feast of First Fruits. 
And that's the day Paul tells us that Christ Jesus rose from the dead as the first fruits of the resurrection. We call that Easter or Resurrection Sunday. Cutting off 50 days from Easter, from the Feast of First Fruits, is Pentecost, in the Greek, Penta 50, but it's actually the Greek, I'm sorry, the Hebrew festival Shavuot, the spring grain harvest. It's when the church began, when Peter spoke in the temple and 3,000 Jews converted to Christ that day. It is the beginning of the Christian church on the Feast of Pentecost, the first harvest of souls on the festival of the spring harvest. Can't be a coincidence. These were rehearsals for Christ, for the Messiah, given to the Jews in the wilderness. Well, it stands to reason that in the second coming, Christ Jesus may very likely fulfill the fall convocations. The Feast of Trumpets could be the rapture. We'll explain why in a few minutes. The Day of Atonement could be Christ's return. When they mourn for him, when the Jews mourn for him, whom they pierce, on the day of mourning, the day of maximum mourning of the Jewish year, in fulfillment of Zechariah 12.10, when Christ stands on the Mount of Olives. And the Jews who have now come to an understanding of this Jesus all along during the tribulation period mourn for him, mourn for their Messiah. And finally, the Feast of Tabernacles may be the beginning of Christ's thousand-year reign. The Feast of Tabernacles lasts eight days. In the eighth day, eight is the number of new beginnings in the Jewish gematria, their numeric counting system, where everything, every number has a meaning. And this is the beginning, again, of the new Torah cycle. Could be the beginning, again, of Christ's millennial reign. All these things seem to match up perfectly. You be the judge. Once again, Mikrahim, the spring convocations, rehearsals for Christ's first coming, as the sacrificial lamb of God, the fall convocations, rehearsals for Christ's second coming, as the conquering lion of Judah. Rabbi Saul, the Apostle Paul states in 1 Corinthians, listen, I tell you a mystery. There we go again, mysterion. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must be clothed, must clothe itself with the imperishable, and with the mortal with immortality. Could this be the rapture? Well, this is what uh, those that are premillennial believe is the actual time when Paul explains the rapture. He also explains that in 1 Thessalonians 4.15. Brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep uh, with him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and get this, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. 1 Thessalonians. With the trumpet call of God. Now, the rapture could possibly be on a future feast of trumpets. Now, here's why. You be the judge. Paul was a Jew. And when he said this would take place at the last trumpet, it may have meant something very significant to the Jews. If I, as an American, were to ask you uh, if I could join you for dinner on Turkey Day, you'd know that I meant Thanksgiving. If I wanted to come and watch the fireworks with you, it would probably be Independence Day, the 4th of July. To an American, that resonates. To people in the rest of the world, they wouldn't really know or care what you're talking about. To a Jew, the last trumpet has significant meaning because... On the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, also Rosh Hashanah, on the Feast of Trumpets, 31 trumpet blasts were blown over a 48-hour period. Shofars in the temple, 31. And the last trumpet, the last trumpet was blown at sundown at the end of the 48-hour festival. And that marked the beginning of the eight days of awe and penitence leading up to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The last trumpet is a very specific day to the Jews, or meaning to the Jews. 
which makes me believe, and many believe, that a future Rosh Hashanah would be the day of the rapture at the last trumpet. Road sign number six, the two witnesses from Revelation 11. The two witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees or the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. We read about them in Zechariah 4 in the Old Testament. Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and on the left of the lampstand? So he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. If anyone tries to harm the two witnesses, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. These men have power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now, haven't we seen those faces before? This is Revelation. This is the time of the end, these two witnesses. But don't they remind you of someone? The two witnesses, fire from their mouths can destroy their enemies. They can call fire down to destroy their enemies. They can shut up the rain. They can turn the waters into blood. And they can strike the earth with any kind of plague they desire. Certainly these are types of Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah who did these very same plagues in the Old Testament. Now, who of all the people that have ever lived has witnessed, remember the two witnesses, has witnessed the Lord in his pre-incarnate form, in his earthly body, and in his glorified body. Only two people that have ever lived. Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah both witnessed the pre-incarnate Christ in the exact same place, perhaps a thousand years apart, on Mount Horeb, both standing in a cave, in a cave, when Christ in his pre-incarnate form passed by. How can that be a coincidence? And both in Mount Horeb. They're the same who are with Jesus and see Jesus in his earthly body on the Mount of Transfiguration and also see Jesus in his glorified body. Moses and Elijah, the only two people who have ever lived that clearly have witnessed Christ in all physical forms. What was the expectation of Israel? What were they looking for? You might remember the story of John the Baptist when he's at the Jordan and the wise men from Jerusalem, the scribes and Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, send learned men to find out who he is, what his mission is. Now this was John's testimony, John the Baptist's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, <coughs> excuse me, I am not the Christ, not the Messiah. They then asked him, well, who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? Now, the prophet to the Jews could only be one person, Moses. He answered, no. Finally, they said, well, who are you? And of course, he says, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. But mark this now. This would be like me asking you um, uh, if, if you're the Messiah, and you say, well, no, I'm not. Then I would say, well, are you a George Washington? And you say, well, no, I'm not. Well, then are you uh, Abraham Lincoln? Well, silly questions, but here's the point. These were the most learned men in Israel coming to ask, first of all, whether he was the Messiah, because they were expecting the Messiah to come. When he said he wasn't, then they asked if he was Elijah, who had been gone for 600 years. And he said, no. Well, then are you Moses, who had been gone for 1,500 years? And they thought that he could be. They thought that he could be. The expectation of Israel. And here's why. The very last words, the very last words that God gave the Jews, his chosen people, in the Old Testament, their Tanakh, <coughs> before the coming of Messiah, five, 600 years later, was the book of 
of the book of Malachi. And Malachi chapter 4 is the last chapter of the last book that God gave to chosen people. And in the very last verses of the last book, this is what we read. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. The Jews expected Moses and Elijah to return. I believe that Moses and Elijah actually are the two living witnesses of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not types, but the actual authentic Moses and Elijah reanimated. As you know that um, Elijah never saw death. He was translated alive into heaven. Moses did die. We find that in Deuteronomy. Uh, but uh, he had a very interesting situation. He didn't die of old age. It said that his eyes were not weak nor his strength gone at 120 years of age. But it also says in Jude, in the little book of Jude, it says that even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil over the body of Moses, did not bring an accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Who do you think won that battle? Clearly, Moses got a special dispensation. Otherwise, how could he appear phys physically on the Mount of Transfiguration? The two witnesses. We talk about this in detail in an earlier session. You may want to go on our website and refer back to it. Roadside number seven, the battle of Gog and Magog from Ezekiel 38. I would argue that these are today's headlines 2,600 years ago. The book of Ezekiel. The battle of Gog and Magog. Here again, we have to look through Jewish eyes and parse what is written. I'm going to read it first out of the NIV, and then we're going to try to look at it through Jewish eyes. The Future Invasion of Israel, written 2,600 years ago. The word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel, son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and bring you out with your whole army. Persia and Cush and Put will be with them. Also Gomer with all its troops and Beth Tagarma from the north with all its troops and many nations with you. On the mountains of Israel you will fall, you and all your troops and the nations with you. Looking through Jewish eyes, what does that mean? Well, out of today's headlines, who are those guys? Well, Rosh, Misha, and Tubal were places at the time of Ezekiel but we know that today, Rosh is Russia. And here's where this comes together. It's the land of the far north. If you put your finger on Jerusalem and just move it on the globe, you're in Russia. You're almost, you're almost virtually in Moscow. And interestingly enough, when this was translated, when the Hebrew was translated into the Greek Septuagint, the word Rosh in the Hebrew was translated Rus, R-U-S in the Greek, the root word for the word Russia. Meshach in the Greek is the Moskoi, from which the, the uh, Russians get the name Moscow. And Tuval is Tuval, it's Russian Siberia. Clearly, Ezekiel is being told that a future invasion from Russia is going to take place against Israel. For centuries, for centuries, I have a number of uh, different things that I've, uh, that I've read, where Jewish rabbis for centuries believed that Israel had to be regathered to the Promised Land because a future czar, in their understanding, a czar of Russia would have to invade Israel someday. So clearly Russia is one of the nations lined up in Ezekiel 38 to, to invade Israel. Well, once again, who is Persia? Well, Persia is an easy one. If you're a stamp collector, you know that even to this day, this country calls their stamps, Persian stamps, postus Persanis, Iran. Iran is ancient Persia. Cush, well, Cush to the ancients at the time of Ezekiel, Cush represented all they knew of sub-Saharan black Africa. Ethiopia was Cush. So in, es in essence, Africa as much as they knew it. Put, Put at the time of Ezekiel was modern North Africa, specifically the land where Libya is today. In other words, the Arab nations of North Africa. 
Gomer is an easy one if you speak Yiddish. Yiddish is a, a combination of, of uh, German and uh, uh, of Hebrew. And uh, Gomer in Yiddish is Germany. And finally, Beth the Garma, the land to the north, uh, scholars would believe that uh, this may very likely be Turkey. So you have Russia, Iran, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Arab nations, Germany, and Turkey seemingly lined up in the last days in a coalition under Gog, the Prince of Rosh, the head of Russia, to invade Israel. Now, do these nations love Israel today? Well, that's a big yet, <laughs> big Russian yet. But it wasn't always so, and that's what's remarkable about this. And this is what struck me. God put hooks in every one of these nations' jaws. If you go back to our study that we did uh, uh, earlier, it's on our website uh, on the Battle of Gog and Magog, we make the case that every single one of these nations was either partial to Israel or peaceful with Israel prior to something happen and putting them in the place that they are today. The only exception was Russia. Russia under the Soviet Union was anti-Israel, but then they had the fall of the Soviet Union, and they, have been, they haven't really been friendly, but they haven't been antagonistic. But remember what is said. God is going to put hooks in their jaws and turn them around. It struck me that Russia first had to fall, the Soviet Union first had to fall, so that God can turn them around once again and bring them out against Israel in the future. Hooks in their jaws. Refer back uh, to our teaching. There's also the War of Psalm 83, which I believe is the exact same thing. It's just more nations added to the pile that invade and attack Israel. These are the ancient nations uh, and lands stated in, uh, in the Psalm and uh, who they are today. Assyria is today Syria. Uh, Tyre, Sidon, Byblos is modern-day Lebanon. Ammon, Edom, Moab, modern-day Jordan. Babylon, of course, is modern-day Iraq. Midian, Saudi Arabia. The Hagrites or the Hagarenes, modern-day Egypt. The Ishmaelites would be the Arab nations. Philistia would be Palestine. God's judgment. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. On the mountains of Israel, you, God, you leader of this coalition, you will actually lead the army. You will all fall, and all your troops and the nations with you. God, the commander of this Russo-Muslim coalition, it says in Ezekiel 38, he's a prince, the leader of Rosh, Russia from the far north. He derives an evil scheme against Israel. Just think after the rapture what would take place. This would give the Russians an opportunity to get their glory back. And what do they do? They get all their allies against the one common enemy they've always had, Israel, and decide to invade Israel and get that, that warm water port on the Mediterranean that Russia has wanted for literally hundreds and hundreds of years. He personally leads the coalition armies against Israel. He's the man on horseback, Ezekiel 38. He, God, will be slain on the mountains of Israel with the entire coalition army. The Jews prevail. God fights for them. And the entire coalition army is annihilated. And then, get this, their home nations will also be destroyed by fire. We talk about this in detail as to how this may take place. And this is in our uh, earlier study uh, that you can find again on our website. It occurs at the start of the tribulation period. At the start. The reason we believe this is the following passage. Then those that live in the towns of Israel, the victorious Jews, will go out and use the captured weapons for fuel and burn them up for seven years. They will use them for fuel. So for the entire length of the tribulation period, they're using these captured weapons for fuel and whatever else they make out of them. Clearly the start, World War III, if you would, at the beginning of the tribulation period. Please note, if you were born prior to 1967, based on this prophecy, the Lord really could not have returned biblically. And we make this case, uh, again, in our earlier uh, session, where we talk about all these different things that had to be fulfilled that have not been fulfilled until our lifetime. Well, here's one example of that, but it's pretty cool when you be the judge. Remember, on the mountains of Israel, you, God, will fall, you and your troops, and the nations with you. They're going to attack and be destroyed on the mountains of Israel. This is a map of Israel in 1967. If you look closely, the West Bank, which used to be part of Jordan, is where the mountains of Israel are. Israel did not own them until the 1967 war, when they conquered them and took them from Jordan. 
They did not have the mountains of Israel as part of Israel prior to 1967. Roadside number eight, Revelation 19, the return of our Lord, the battle of God and Magog, and the Antichrist. The Antichrist and the false prophet. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. This is from 1 John 4. He wrote this approximately 95 AD, that the spirit of Antichrist was already in the world. In Revelation we read, And I saw a beast coming from out of the sea. The dragon, Satan, gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, but they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? And I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth worship the first beast. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing the fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men. Paul writes in his second letter to the Thessalonians, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, which he wrote in his first letter, in 1 Thessalonians 4, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship. So that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. The abomination that causes desolation. The Antichrist and the false prophet. One a political leader, I would argue. The other a religious leader. Now, Satan does not know the day or the hour. So he has had to have an Antichrist candidate in the on-deck circle for the past 2,000 years, ready to step in at a moment's notice once the rapture takes place. And as a brief digression note, Paul was writing his second letter to the Thessalonians because they thought that the rapture had already taken place and had left them. Clearly evidence for a pre-trib rapture. Because he said, no, it's not going to happen until the man of lawlessness. In summary, the Antichrist will rise during the final week, Shavuot, of Daniel's 70-week prophecy. He will first be revealed to the world when the great restraint of the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, the rapture. The Antichrist will first appear as a man of peace, establishing a covenant with Israel. The false prophet will rise and give homage to the Antichrist, forcing the world to also worship him and his image. All will be forced to take the mark of the beast. The false prophet will perform counterfeit signs and miracles on behalf of the Antichrist. The Antichrist will suffer a fatal head wound and be miraculously healed. Israel, the believing Jews, will be persecuted for three and a half years and will escape to the desert sanctuary. At the midpoint of the tribulation period, the Antichrist will desecrate the temple and proclaim himself to be God. His number is 666. Six is the Hebrew number of man and sin. At the end of the seven-year tribulation period, the Lord Jesus will return in glory with the armies of heaven, including us. His church will be with him. The kings and armies of the earth will come together and join the Antichrist at the plains of Armageddon to make war on Christ, the believing Jews, and the saints. Christ will totally destroy the enemies of God with the sword of his mouth with his word. His word will destroy them. The Antichrist and the false prophet will be cast eternally into the lake of fire. And the birds of Megiddo. When I first went to Israel the first time, I was standing there, it was 1999, and we were looking over the plains of Megiddo, where Armageddon, where this last battle will take place. And our tour guide said, this is the greatest bird watching site on the planet Earth. I thought, what? Bird watching site? Revelation. On the mount and, and Ezekiel, on the mountains of Israel, you will fall. You and all your troops and the nations with you. I will give you as food to all kinds of carrion birds and to all the wild animals. 
And I saw an angel in Revelation stand, standing in the sun, who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. The enemies of God were killed with the sword, coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. He said it was the greatest bird watching site on the planet Earth, and here's why. It is the linkage between three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. The flyways all converge through the plains of Megiddo. They can't go to the north because what they would be is over the Mediterranean. There's no provender. There's no food. To the south is the deserts of Arabia. Once again, there's nothing to eat. They converge through these three flyways, the greatest migratory path, Europe, Asia, and Africa through the plains of Megiddo. God, it's an amazing plan. And I might add an amazing sense of humor. Wow. Road sign number nine, Zechariah 12.10. A day of the Lord is coming, Jerusalem, when your possessions will be plundered and divided up within your very walls. I, God, will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. This is the battle of Armageddon. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on a day of battle, when the Lord Jesus comes with the armies of heaven. And this is from Zechariah 12.10. And I, God, will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the Jews, a spirit of grace and supplication. They, the Jews, the Jews that have been saved out of the tribulation period, who now know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. When Christ Jesus stands in the Mount of Olives and the Jews mourn for him as their Messiah. And in Zechariah 14, just a few chapters, two chapters later, four chapters later, on that day, his feet, the Lord's feet, will stand in the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord in his name, the only name. The great victory of our Lord. Let that picture just, just bless you. Well, this is a break through a plate glass window. You be a judge. This is road sign number 10. Our last road sign on our journey through the prophetic end times. And we go back to Daniel where it all started. But this is the very end of the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 12. Verses 1 through 12. What of the Lord's return? Now we talked before about how it seemed amazing that the Lord's first coming was so precise that Daniel nailed it so precisely that Gabriel gave him the exact year. If you go back and look at our session earlier, we'll even share with you that he gave it to the exact day. To the exact day that the Lord Jesus would return. But what of the Lord's second coming? What of the Lord's return? Wouldn't you believe it would be equally precise prophetically? Doesn't it make sense that the Lord has that equally planned out, that it will be equally, equally precise? Well, to fully understand the book of Revelation, one must first begin with the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is to the Old Testament what the book of Revelation is to the New. They're a hand to glove, a hand to cliche fit. You can't have Revelation without Daniel. And the book of Daniel ends with the start of the tribulation period as recorded some 600 years later in the book of Revelation. It's the seal scroll. In Daniel chapter 12, we read the following. There will be a time of distress such as it has not happened from the beginning of nations until then, the tribulation period. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered, the Jews. But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Now, Gabriel has given him these amazing prophecies throughout, throughout the book of Daniel. And then says, seal them up now for the time of the end and forget about them. Well, Revelation now 
is the revealing of the time of the end. And I believe that that sealed scroll at the end of Daniel is the scroll that we read about in Revelation 5. Then I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And that, we believe, is the seven seals, the apocalypse, the seven seals of Revelation. Now this is my personal view. You have to hold me to a very strict biblical standard. You have to be where I'm a man. And what I say has of no value whatsoever unless I can make a biblical case for it. And even then, you have to interpret it as you would. But once again, this is, uh, this is a view that, uh, that I hold uh, for, your, uh, for you to consider. This is Daniel's concluding puzzle. This is something that had uh, confounded me, and I should say has confounded scholars for, for generations. And it's the following. This is the, the end of the book of Daniel. I, Daniel, heard, but I did not understand. So I asked, my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? He replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished, and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. Well, that struck me as really hard to understand. There seems to be three counts of days. The tribulation period of Revelation and the 70th week Shavuot of Daniel Chapter 9 is seven years in length. And we know that there are two periods of 1,260 days comprising a Jewish year of 360 days, a lunar year. It's 1,260 days after the abomination that causes desolation that the Lord returns. The last half of the tribulation period is 1,260 days. So what is this 1,290 days? that he talks about three chapters later. It is at the midpoint of the tribulation period that the Antichrist sets up the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of by Daniel and quoted by the Lord Jesus. Yet Daniel is also told that there will be 1,290 days that elapses after the Antichrist desecrates the temple until the end, an addition of 30 days. Is it 1260 or is it 1290? Now, I'm going to challenge each of you. I don't know where you're sitting. I don't know uh, what Bible you use. But I've done this with classes literally all over the, the country and uh, in some parts of the world. And I've challenged them with this. Look at the line notes in your Bible, if you have line notes, and see what they tell you this, this means, this 1,290 days. It's going to be probably one of two things. We're either going to make it a reference, and maybe he's talking about uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, who was the... Greek king who tried to destroy the Jews was a type of the Antichrist, not the Antichrist himself, because that took place 150 years before the birth of Jesus, but that's what Hanukkah, the story of Hanukkah, is all about. So they're going to mention him as a, but he's a type of Antichrist. It has nothing to do with the last days. Or they're going to say it's a type of, it's a, it's a count of days and basically leave it hang there because they have no idea what it means. It just hangs there. It's another count of days. Well, you have to look through Jewish eyes, and this is what I would offer. This is my personal belief. The Lord fulfilled, as we said before, each of the four spring holy convocations given to Moses in Leviticus 23. Remember we said Christ was sacrificed, our Passover lamb, on the day of preparation. Passover. He was entombed as the sinless bread of life during the Passover feast of unleavened bread. Christ rose as the first fruits of the resurrection on the feast of first fruits, always the Sunday after Passover. And the church began on Shavuot, Pentecost, the festival of the spring grain harvest, the first harvest of souls. No coincidence. This was the, in accordance with the mission of Christ's first advent as the sacrificial lamb of God. Remember we said it's fair to assume, therefore, that Christ's second coming will be linked with the fall convocations. The rapture of the church may occur at the last trumpet on the Jewish Feast of Trumpets. 
Perhaps Christ's second coming as the conquering Lion of Judah will be in a future Jewish Day of Atonement, when the victorious Lord Jesus will stand at the Mount of Olives. And could it also be that Christ will begin his millennial reign on a future Feast of Tabernacles, when all things are renewed with a new beginning? Now remember, the Hebrew word for convocation used in Leviticus is mikra. The word is a second meaning. It means rehearsal. These were rehearsals for the coming of the Messiah. We need to look through Jewish eyes. Looking through Jewish eyes, we might be able to ascertain the meaning of the additional 30 days. And we've not read this anywhere else, so hold me accountable if you think this is preposterous. But I just think this is stunning. It cannot be a coincidence in my mind. In Zechariah we read, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. Remember, they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him, mourn for Jesus as one mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Now, I believe that this would take place conceivably on a future day of atonement, that everything matches up. Rosh Hashanah is the rapture, the day of atonement. After Armageddon, the Lord stands on the Mount of Olives when they mourn for him, the day of mourning, the day of atonement. My personal belief is that the Jews will mourn the Messiah Yeshua on a future Yom Kippur when he stands after Armageddon. Now consider again the words of the prophet Zechariah. My personal view is that the Jews will mourn for the crucified Christ on a future Yom Kippur as he stands on the Mount of Olives and fulfills this Zechariah 12 and 14. We know from the death of Moses in Deuteronomy 34 that a period of weeping and mourning lasted 30 days. 30 days. And Moses said that there would be a greater prophet coming after him. Christ's second coming, 1260 days after the midpoint of the tribulation period. And then the time of mourning, an additional 30 days for a total of 1290 days. Wow. Looking through Jewish eyes. Remember, Christ's first official advent was in fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9 when he entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, lowly and riding on a donkey, predicted in Zechariah 9.9. Is it any surprise that Zechariah also predicted his second coming? I believe that his second coming was also foretold in the end times prophecies of Zechariah. But wait, that's not it. That's not the end. From that time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. But blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. What? What is that now? Well, what is that? An additional 45 days. Exactly 75 days after Yom Kippur, 10th Tishri on their calendar, and 45 days following the 30-day mourning period, every year, whatever it takes place, is sundown 24th Kislev on the Jewish calendar. Sundown 24th Kislev, hold on to your yarmulkes, is the beginning of the Feast of Dedication, the first day of Hanukkah. What better day for the future festival when the Lord Jesus will dedicate the Millennial Temple, but on the Feast of Dedication. Looking through Jewish eyes. The Lord Jesus said no one knows about that day or hour. No one knows about that day or hour. So we have to be careful when we look ahead. We get a blessing for loving the day of the Lord's return. But can we go ahead and actually try to pinpoint when he's going to come? Well, of course, that's foolish for anyone to truly think so. But we are to be awake and alert. The Lord Jesus, though, said no man knows the day or the hour. And that's what scholars have clung to, uh, you know, for literally for 2,000 years. I want to share something with you that uh, I think is rather provocative. You be the judge. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in his first letter to the Thessalonians, right after he tells them about the rapture for the first time, 
in 1 Thessalonians 4. Just a few verses later, he writes this. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. We will not be surprised like a thief in the night. Well, that's curious. But wait, there's an obvious contradiction here. How do Paul's words square with those of the Lord Jesus? No one knows the day or the hour, nor even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Well, who's correct? Paul or the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, let's, uh, let's have a show of hands here. How many vote for the Apostle Paul? Yeah, I didn't think so. No hands. How about the Lord Jesus? Oh, there they are. Well, the answer is you're half right. Because both are equally correct, speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is the perfect word of God. This is the inerrant word of God. Now, Paul is, Paul is not Jesus. Don't get me wrong. It's, I'm not trying to suggest in any way that Paul has equal authority to Jesus. But he is speaking here under the inerrant leading of the Holy Scripture. He's under the inspiration of the Holy Scripture. He has to be 100% correct here. As Jesus is always 100% correct. So how can you square the two? This is God's inerrant word. But it clearly can only be squared this way. They're both talking to two different audiences. Christ is speaking to the Jews. Certainly they'll be surprised. That's what the time of Jacob's trouble is all about. That's what the tribulation period is for. It's the 70th week of Daniel. That last Shepherd left in Daniel chapter 9. The greatest prophecy in the Old Testament. They will be surprised. But Paul is writing to the church. Not surprised because we're not in darkness. When the Lord Jesus said no one knows about that day or the hour. Not even the sun. Remember, he was talking in his human form. Jesus had to step out of parts of his Godhead in order to be tempted on the mountain, in order to be killed, in order to rise from the dead. He never ceases to be God. He's always fully God. But he does clearly step out some of his attributes, or he couldn't do the things that he does as a man. He couldn't be tempted, couldn't be killed, etc. Certainly he knows the day or the hour is God Almighty. He's not so he's not subservient to the Father. They're equal. It's a trinity. It's the triune God. It's one God in three persons. But in his human form, he didn't know the day or the hour. But it might even go deeper than that. When the Lord Jesus said, no one knows about that day or the hour, could he be speaking of a future Rosh Hashanah? Because it began with a bar barely visible new moon, Rosh Hashanah, at the time of Jesus, was called the day that no man knows the day or the hour. Remember we said earlier that we at circuit riders believe that it's biblically very likely that the Lord will have the rapture, we'll meet, we will meet the Lord in the air on a future Rosh Hashanah at the last trumpet. Well, interestingly enough, Rosh Hashanah is the day that no man knows the day or the hour. It's easy to find astronomically in any given year when Rosh Hashanah will be because it begins with a new moon. No one can see a new moon. It's completely black. Unlike a full moon, which is completely light. Well, the new moon, once it would just break, once the light would be the slightest crescent, that would be something that would alert the Jews that the day that no man knows the day or the hour was to begin. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Teruah, Jewish New Year, the Feast of Trumpets. Two witnesses were to go to the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem once they saw the beginning of the moon, of the crescent moon, coming from the new moon. At the time of Jesus, the Sanhedrin even had signs. We're told this in, in, in uh, uh, various Jewish writings that they actually had signs, on the, pictures on the wall to demonstrate what a new moon would look like to make sure that the witnesses were giving an accurate description of what they saw. Once the new moon was determined and the day was proclaimed, Rosh Hashanah, Jewish New Year, Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets was proclaimed. The blowing began of the trumpets, the shofars. Thirty trumpet blasts were blown over a 28-hour, oh, sorry, over a 48-hour period until the last trumpet was blown 
at sundown at the end of the 48 hours. It was so important for all the Jews in Israel to know this, that signal fires were lit. Signal fires lit, and you can see it in the distance. The fire is lit here that Rosh Hashanah is beginning. The next fire off in the distance, off in the distance. They would alert everyone, and it would take two days to alert the whole country. Hence, it was a 48-hour day. Rosh Hashanah lasted 48 hours, the day that no man knew the day or the hour. Because everyone had to know when it began, because once it ended, once the last trumpet was blown, there would be the eight days of awe leading up to Yom Kippur. Eight days of penitence leading up to the day of mourning, Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. The day which no man knows the day or the hour. A 48-hour day. The two days of Rosh Hashanah are said to constitute Yoma Arichta, Aramaic for one long day. Commencing at the first sighting of the new moon, numerous shofars, trumpets, sounded throughout the two days. The last trumpet, sun, sundown, day two. Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. So here's the significance of Paul's at the last trumpet. Paul continued his discourse on the rapture. Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. But you brothers are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. Remember, he wrote this right after telling the Thessalonian Greeks about the rapture and telling us, the church, about the rapture. That Paul is using an analogy of a thief breaking into one's home in the dark of the night is clearly indicated. Yet looking through Jewish eyes, another more subtle and equally appropriate analogy may have been also intended. In the second temple period, the temple guards were to stay constantly alert at night. The captain of the temple watch would make his rounds and quietly approach each individual guard post, get this, like a thief. If the guard was caught sleeping, he was beaten severely. Occasionally, the sleeping guard's clothing was lit on fire, ultimately exposing him shamefully naked. This is from the Talmud, Jewish writings, 150 years after Christ. This is their writings talking about the thief in the night. Perhaps that is what the Lord Jesus alluded to when he said, Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Revelation 16. You can't make this up, looking through Jewish eyes. Wow. The rapture, when we meet the Lord in the clouds. Now, I want to conclude with a brick through a plate glass window, and it'll conclude our series. And I want to be careful here, because I know that this is something that um, is quite provocative. And I don't want to give you uh, an, an idea that uh, we at Circuit Writers are trying to set dates. But I do believe that we should be looking for the Lord's return eagerly. And we should be encouraging each other with these words. But when I looked at these days and looked at this through Jewish eyes, something struck me that I, I have to share with you. It is something that is an amazing scenario. Remember again Paul's words, and I, I've said this twice already, but I want to reiterate it. For you know the very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, but you brothers are not in darkness so that this day will surprise you. Is it possible, since we will not be surprised like a thief, that we can look for the signs and try to figure out when the Lord will return? My personal view, hold me accountable. Once again, sola scriptura. But I hope I can make a biblical case for it. Now, we're not setting a date as to when the rapture is going to take place. But I want to share with you a scenario for those of you that are every day going home thinking how horrible the world is becoming, and it is. But again, the hope that this is soon, this is something, again, I think it's just an amazing scenario. You be the judge. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. So he, felt, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. 
Now he had to go through Samaria. When I did my dissertation, I did it on John chapter 4, the woman at the well. And it struck me that uh, when Jesus was in Galilee, he had to get quickly to Jerusalem. Because as it said, that there was a conflict going on between the disciples of uh, John the Baptist and his own disciples. He had to get there quickly. So he told his apostles they were going to make a straight line to Jerusalem through Samaria. Jews never went through Samaria. They went around it, which would add a day or two to the trip. But Jesus, Jesus was in haste. He had to get there quickly. And there he met the woman at the well. The woman at the well. Uh, I postulated that the woman at the well is an interesting story because it's the first time the Lord Jesus ever is recorded speaking to a non-Jew. She's even kind of a hybrid, because Samarians are kind of a hybrid of Gentiles and Jews. So it's kind of a, as uh, Paul says in uh, Galatians, there's no Jew, no Greek, all are one in Christ. They're kind of a, a hybrid. But they're the first non-Jews, the first Gentile that Jesus has ever recorded speaking to. It's also unusual he's speaking to a woman, a solitary woman, as he explains why uh, in the discourse, because uh, uh, a man could not speak to a woman privately unless her spouse was with her. It's the longest conversation Jesus has with anybody in the Gospels, including Nicodemus, including Pontius Pilate. And most importantly, it's the very first person, the very first time, he proclaims himself to be the Messiah, the Son of God. What an amazing event. I postulated in my dissertation that what we have here, quite possibly, is a symbol, a symbol of Christ meeting his bride, the church. Remember, every one of the Old Testament patriarchs met their brides at wells. This is the woman at the well. The bride of Isaac was met at a well. The bride of Jacob was met at a well. This is Jacob's well on top of it. The bride of Moses was met at a well. Even Boaz meets with Ruth in a oasis, which of course was a site of a well. And they were all virgin brides. They were all pure, well, well Ruth had been married before, but they were all they were all pure brides. And what is this woman that Christ meets at the well? She's been married five times. She's now living with a, a man who she's not married to. He's number six. Six is the number of sin in the Jewish gematria. Jesus then, if we now symbolically, and please take this symbolically, if he's meeting now symbolically the bride of Christ, he doesn't get the pure virgin bride. He gets us. He gets the sinners. He gets the sinners. Every one of us has sinned and fallen short. Sin, the number of man is sin. And Jesus is number seven. To the Jews, seven is the number of perfection and completion, purified by the blood of Christ. I believe that this is a symbol of Christ in the church. And um, I, I, you'd have to go back to our studies on this to get, to get more detail of it. But suffice to say, what really intrigues me for our study tonight is then it says that he stayed with the Samaritans who come out and believe in him because of uh, this woman going back and, and uh, witnessing, that they come out and they meet him. And he stays with them for two days. He's no longer in a hurry. He had to get to Galilee, from Galilee to Jerusalem in a hurry. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days, and because of his words, many more became believers. Well, I think the answer comes in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, when the apostle wrote, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. And it struck me, if this is symbolic of the bride of Christ, the time of the church, I'm dispensational. I believe in the dispensations. I believe that we live right now in the dispensation of grace, the dispensation of the church, which began at Pentecost 2,000 years ago. We're talking about the time of the church. Well, since Jesus is now living here with this Gentile group, which may be symbolic of his church, and stays with them two days, maybe this is symbolic of the 2,000 years of the time of the church, the Gentile time of the church. Gentile and Jews, Jews who are Christians as well, but predominantly. In any event, the time of grace, the time of the church. What I want to offer to you is just a scenario. I'm not date setting, but you tell me when you see this, if this doesn't blow you away. It blew me away, you be the judge. 
I would like to think this is an amazing scenario. Yom Kippur in the year 2029 is September 18th, 19th. And I believe that the Lord will return on a future Yom Kippur. We talked about that earlier. Now why 2029 for our scenario? I'm just playing with the numbers. But once again, if a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day, we know without question that the Lord Jesus died and rose again and ascended in the year 30. It's the only year astronomically that there's a full moon which matches up with, with uh, a good Thursday, good Friday, where there's a Palm Sunday. If you go to the 31 or 32 or 28 or 29, for the sake of argument, there's a Palm Wednesday or a good Monday. I mean, it just doesn't work. The only year that works is 30 AD. That's the year of the crucifixion and the resurrection. There's other reasons, too, which you can go back to one of our prior, prior, uh, prior sessions and we explain it in more detail. <coughs> well, if that's the case, 2,000 years later would be the year 2030. So could it be, could it be, I'm just, I'm just throwing this out, I'm not date setting, could it be that the Lord would return in the year 2030, the second coming? Well, okay. But remember, to the Jews, the year doesn't start on January 1st like it does for us. It starts on the previous Rosh Hashanah, Jewish New Year, which is always in the month of September. So Rosh Hashanah would be the start of the year, year 2030 if you want to extrapolate the Jewish year into the Gregorian calendar. So in any event, Jesus then, 2,000 years later, if the Lord was to return the second coming on Yom Kippur, 2,000 years after he left, would be the year 2029. I hope you're with me on this. That's the scenario. I'm just throwing this out. But look at what happens. If that's the case, then, the rapture would have to be seven years earlier. Remember, it's a seven-year tribulation period. Oh, I hope this is true. The rapture, then, would take place on Rosh Hashanah in the year 2022, which would be September 25th to the 27th. Remember, it's a two-day holiday. Sundown on the 27th. The reason I have September 18, 19 for Yom Kippur is it would start, remember, their day starts the previous uh, evening. It'd be our calendar. It starts on our calendar 18 September, but it actually falls on the 19th because their day starts at sundown the day before. So Rosh Hashanah, then, in this scenario, might be, might be, it's a question mark, I'm not date setting, September 25th, to the 27th, the rapture, Rosh Hashanah, 2022. Well, now it gets fun. Remember, it's 1,260 days from the second coming to the abomination that causes desolation. <coughs> if we count back 1,260 days, and believe it or not, I did this, 1,260 days from Yom Kippur 12, 2029, from September 19, 2029, we come forward we come to April 6, 2026. That's the 1260 days earlier. But remember, one other thing has to happen. For four days, for three and a half days, the two witnesses lie dead. They lie dead and are left in the street for three and a half days. We talked about that earlier. The two witnesses of Jesus Christ are killed by the Antichrist. In any event, then, they would be killed, they would be killed on the fifth day, I'm sorry, on the second day, uh, uh, no, I'm saying they'd be killed on the fifth day, and they would, uh, uh, they would, they would be killed on the 1200, I'm, 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 I've got a bad pedal here. They would be killed and be lying in the ground for four days. The actual days, the four days added to that, would be April 2nd through, eight, through April 5th. April 2nd through April 5th. In other words, they would have been killed on April 2nd, and they would rise from the dead on April 5th. The Lord would, would reanimate them and they would be raptured on April 5th. April 2nd, April 2nd, Passover begins. It's the first day of Passover. And April 5th is the Feast of First Fruits. They would be reanimated and raised from the dead on the same day that Jesus was on the Feast of First Fruits. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's astonishing. I mean, that's, to me, that's absolutely astonishing. Four days, they'd be in the ground. They'd be killed on the first day of Passover. Remember it talks about Elijah has to come on a future Passover and be killed on a future Passover, first day conceivably, 
and rise on the Feast of First Fruits like they're going. It gets even more wild. Look at this. That means then that a day earlier, on April 1st, would be the desecration, the abomination that causes desecration. The Antichrist desecrates the temple April 1st, 14 this in the day of preparation. He proclaims himself to be God on the very same day that Christ Jesus was crucified. Talk about mocking Christ. The abomination that causes desolation on the same Jewish calendar day that the Lord Jesus was crucified. 1260 days earlier, coming forward another 1260 days, is April 17th, 18th, the last and greatest day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Could that be then when the two witnesses arrive? Remember what Peter said on the Mount of Transfiguration. It is good for us to be here, Lord. Let us build tabernacles for you and Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah arriving on the last and greatest day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the day the tribulation period begins. Wow. <laughs> wow. Not date setting, but I'm throwing it at you as just a fun scenario looking through Jewish eyes. You be the judge. The road signs of prophecy. In conclusion, after more than 40 years of prayer and research, I believe the rapture pre-trib is coming very soon. I believe that all the necessary biblical prophecies have been fulfilled. I believe that we are not, uh, and they were not fulfilled before this present generation. I believe that the Antichrist, the false prophet, and God, the Prince of Rus, from Ezekiel 38, are now alive and walking the earth. I believe that the two witnesses will arrive, and that they really are Moses and Elijah. I believe that we are living in the days of the apostate church of Laodicea. Church, repent. The churches are becoming dissolved. They're becoming lukewarm across the world. The time of Laodicea, the church of Laodicea, the church that Christ spits out of his mouth because it's neither, neither hot nor cold. I believe that it's commensurate at the same time with the church of Philadelphia, which I believe we, the true believers, are in that the Lord will take away from the day of before the day of wrath, the rapture. I believe that the nations of Ezekiel 38 and Psalm 83 are now aligned and ready to attack Israel, every one of them. I believe that Russia, Iran, the Arab nations, and their allies will be totally destroyed in the War of Gog and Magog, World War III. And this is something that uh, uh, is provocative, but I'm going to throw it out. I believe that's the end of Islam, that that will be the end of Islam. Muslims will have a very difficult time during the tribulation period because they will not take the mark of the beast. They will not worship a man as God. They don't worship Muhammad. They only worship Allah. So there's got to be something, and I believe that I believe Islam's destroyed the battle of Gog and Magog. That all the Arab nations, all of the Muslim nations, it's just the end of it, and uh, that uh, it really is a problem that uh, uh, the Antichrist takes over the world and uh, Islam is removed. The Antichrist signs a seven-year Peace, and of course that's in quotes because there's no peace. Peace pact with Israel. I believe that Moses and Elijah torment the world with plagues for three and a half years. And that they evangelize the Jews and fulfill Romans 11. When the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, then Israel will be saved. I believe that the Ark of the Covenant will be returned to Israel. And I believe that in Jerusalem, the temple will be rebuilt. It'll be done in less than three years so that the Antichrist can desecrate it at the midpoint of the tribulation. I believe that the false prophet will perform counterfeit signs and miracles on behalf of the Antichrist. And I believe that the damned, and I hate to say it, but the damned will take the mark of the beast. I believe that at the midpoint of the tribulation period, the Antichrist proclaims himself to be God. And I believe that the abomination that causes desolation in the temple will take place at that point fulfilling Daniel 9 and Christ's words in Matthew 24. I believe that the Antichrist slays the two witnesses in Jerusalem and the whole world watches and celebrates. And after three and a half days, the two witnesses are raised by God and raptured up to heaven. I believe that under persecution, the believing converted Jews now flee to the wilderness sanctuary prepared by God, the time of Jacob's trouble. 
Jeremiah 30, verse 7. I believe that the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowl judgments, as we describe cause and effect, take place then over this period. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the exciting news, we, the believing bride of Christ, will be with the Lord in heaven at the wedding feast of the Lamb. The greatest party in the history of the universe, in the history of creation. Be there. Be there. Accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. Be there. I believe that after seven years, the glorious second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then the battle of Armageddon. And I believe that the Antichrist and the false prophet will be cast to the lake of fire. And Satan will be bound for a thousand years during the millennium. I believe that on Yom Kippur, the victorious Christ Jesus will stand on the Mount of Olives. And the redeemed Jews will mourn for 30 days the Messiah they have pierced in fulfillment of Zechariah 12.10. And I believe that 45 days later, the temple may be dedicated on a future 24th Kislev of Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. The glorious thousand-year reign of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus on King David's throne. And I believe that the time is very near. God is separating the sheep from the goats. We must each repent, get right with God, and boldly witness to those who are yet lost. And finally, my friends, my dear Christian friends and fellow followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, please be assured of one thing. Whatever happens, and whenever it happens, date setting notwithstanding, whatever happens and whenever it happens, I believe that in Christ we are either going to win or we are going to win. To God alone the glory. Thank you for being with us. Come Lord Jesus. Amen. Come Lord Jesus.